<laughs> well, welcome. Oh, here we go. Now here I, we are. I was like, wait, it's supposed to pop up. There we go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's supposed to be that little bubble, right? <laughs> Well, we are so grateful to have Dr. Lexi Locke, naturopathic doctor in Oregon, and the Terry Naturally Educator, speaking on a wonderful topic of uh, three tools for optimizing brain performance. Thank you so much, Dr. Lexi. Oh, thank you so much. It's always great to be with you, Elizabeth, and the Marlene's Market and Delhi team. I know you put so much time and effort into making these wonderful educational resources available to people, whether they're attending live, thank you so much, or listening to this on your YouTube page. So, so grateful to have this opportunity to talk to you all today about optimizing brain performance. So before we dive in, just a little bit of background about myself. My name is Dr. Lexi Locke. I graduated from NUNM, which is a naturopathic university out here in Portland, Oregon. So I have my license in both Oregon and Washington. In addition to that, I also work for Europharma, which is a supplement company, makers of the Terry Naturally brand. I will be talking about ingredients today, but no specific product names. I love, love, love to educate about natural medicines and what they can do for us. So if you have questions about product specific things, the team at Marlene's will be more than happy to answer any of those. So I'm a medical writer, editor, educator, um, also love to play sports. I recently got back into competitive volleyball, had a really fun snowboarding season, also downhill longboarding. So and then I'm also a proud dog mom to five dogs. My apologies in advance if any of them make themselves known. They should theoretically be inside right now, but you never know. So for those of you who are maybe a little less familiar with naturopathic medicine, I just wanted to give a quick little overview here. So we use this kind of what we call a hierarchy. And at the very bottom of the triangle are things that I think we should be doing you know, every single day. So these are the foundations of health. And that's really what our our talk today is going to focus on. Um, as we go up that triangle, there's, you know, more uh, side effects typically that occur, you know, all the way up at the top, we have things like, you know, surgery and um, chemotherapy, radiation, also prescription medications. So I'm going to focus today's talk on the foundations of health. So things like sleep, nutrition, movement, hydration, all of the wonderful things that um, the tools that we can use on a daily basis. So we're really talking about brain health today, and I think a lot of us are probably familiar with some of our symptoms of brain dysfunction. You know, when our brain isn't functioning optimally, we may suffer from things like brain fog. So feeling, you know, I sometimes describe this as feeling like my brain is full of mashed potatoes, you know, just really not being able to come up with um, the sentences or the things that we need to do, which kind of ties into trouble concentrating, focusing. Also, of course, memory, memory loss. This kind of happens on a spectrum. It could be more short term or it could be short and long term memory issues impaired decision-making ability, and then also emotional unpredictability. So some of the mood disorders, things maybe like anxiety and depression, can oftentimes signal some underlying brain dysfunction. So then, of course, that leads us to the question of what causes brain dysfunction. And a lot of things that I think about when we're talking the foundations of health are going to be things like nutrient deficiencies. There are vitamins and minerals and, you know, essential fatty acids and things that we need to keep our body and our brains happy and healthy. Uh, a lot of us lead more of a sedentary lifestyle, so we're sitting a lot, um, and this makes it really difficult to get proper blood flow to the brain, which can contribute again to things like brain fog and some of those other symptoms. Injury or illnesses, sometimes these can be short-term uh, memory impairments or longer-term issues, people who have traumatic brain injuries and things like that. Also chronically high blood sugar, blood sugar um, variations, whether it's high or low, can cause a lot of difficulties with concentration, uh, focusing, also certain toxic exposures. Unfortunately, we're living in a more toxic environment and that makes it tricky for our bodies to stay in balance. And again, we see that in our brain, our central nervous system, which is brain and spinal cord. So then overall, all of these kind of lead to things like oxidative stress and inflammation. 
I feel like these are kind of buzzwords right now. You know, inflammation is not necessarily good or bad. When we fall down, sprain an ankle, it gets hot, swollen, tender. That is what we consider acute inflammation. That's the body's normal healing response. But when we don't have the right tools on board, that acute inflammation may progress into chronic inflammation. And chronic inflammation typically doesn't have any signs or symptoms, um, but it may lead to some brain dysfunction. So inflammation, oxidative stress are also major contributors to having issues with um, our ability to, you know, focus, concentrate. And I think for a lot of people, you know, there's various conditions that we can, we can be diagnosed with. Um, but again, all tying into some underlying brain dysfunction. So 10% of the population suffer from depression. Um, and I think we saw a huge rise in depression cases when we, you know, were in the pandemic, even kiddos, school-aged kids, adolescents were struggling with depression and also anxiety. You know, 20% of adults are dealing with an underlying anxiety disorder. Um, I didn't grab the statistics for kids, but I think it would probably be pretty similar to that too. And then 10% of older adults have some type of neurological impairment, whether that's dementia, Alzheimer's disease. Um, and I'm not going to focus a lot on headaches or migraines today, just because that could be like a whole topic in itself. But headaches and migraines are also um, pretty common with about 17% of people dealing with those. So the first tool we are going to talk about for our brain health is going to be food as medicine. So like I said, I really focus on the foundations of health and what we consume on a daily basis is absolutely going to impact how our whole body functions, including our brain. So I love the little picture here with this brain and the walnut because there's kind of this old adage in medicine called the doctrine of signatures. And really it was kind of this idea that what foods look like have some impact on, you know, what body system that they can benefit. So, you know, if you sliced a carrot down the center, it kind of looks like an eyeball. And we know that carrots are good for vision and eye health. And then of course, if you look at a walnut, you're like, gosh, that sure looks like a nice, happy brain. So walnuts are definitely a really wonderful food for um, helping to support brain health. Now, when it comes to nutrition advice, um, I typically like to give ideas for people to focus on. You know, I think there's a lot of restrictive dietary patterns out there. So what I really like to do is say, here are some of the key foods that you can utilize for brain health specifically. So there was an interesting study showing that a quarter cup per day of walnuts was shown to decrease the likelihood of depression. You know, I think walnuts are super tasty. I mean, a quarter cup per day, maybe, you know, you want to do a quarter cup every other day. But I just found it really interesting that, you know, we know that walnuts have um, really good quality fats in them, which are, of course, very supportive to the brain. And then tea and coffee. You know, some people are a little more sensitive to coffee, so they may tolerate green tea a little bit better. But we know that, you know, caffeine does have somewhat of an impact on our mental functioning and our focus. And for those who are avoiding caffeine, we'll talk about uh, ginseng at the end, which can be um, just as great for focus and concentration without having maybe any of the jitters for some folks who are a little bit more sensitive to caffeine. Uh, green vegetables are very, very rich in nutrients that help to, you know, slow cognitive decline. So eat that salad, or especially right now, there's such an abundance of green vegetables coming up and at the farmer's markets, at our health food stores. So green vegetables contain a lot of the nutrients that we need for brain health. Fatty fish. So these are one of the best sources of omega-3s. Um, North Atlantic salmon are a really great option, sometimes herring or mackerel, anchovies. Basically, these omega-3s that are found in some of the fatty fish are absolutely essential for our overall health and well-being. Our body can't produce omega-3s, so we need to get them, um, whether it's through a supplemental form or through our diet. So omega-3s are really help to make up kind of the structure of our cell membranes in every single cell in our body and are a key component in our brain and our neurological system. And then Elizabeth and I were just talking about berries or coming into berry season right now, some other salmon berries, raspberries, strawberries, whatever berry, you know, you choose. 
Um, the, the fact that berries are so colorful is because they have these amazing um, phytonutrients. So plant-based nutrients, a lot of different classes of these, but one of them are called flavonoids and flavonoids themselves have been shown to improve memory. So I think that if we're thinking about long-term health, these are some really great options to kind of tie into our dietary habits. Now, there was an interesting study looking at um, a broad variety of foods and their antidepressive abilities. So the researchers were examining foods that had uh, some key nutrients that were, um, whether it was like B vitamins or other vitamins, folate, omega-3s, which had been previously studied for relieving depression or improving depression symptoms. So they looked at foods that had those nutrients and then kind of rated them um, on a scale. And one of the most antidepressant foods is something called watercress. So again, one of those green leafy vegetables followed by spinach and lettuce and fresh herbs, also oysters, a uh, wide variety of vegetables. And then we see some berries. So Really interesting that, again, we're using food as medicine here to really boost our mood, boost our brain health, um, and really kind of promoting longevity as a whole. So that was our first tool. We had our um, nutrition, and now our second tool is going to be lifestyle modifications. Lifestyle and nutrition are like my bread and butter. Those are things that I focus on with every single patient. I think we all need, you know, a little... Um, little coaching in these areas. And each day is completely different. Some days it's like, you know, you may be able to eat exactly what you were planning on for, you know, your two or three meals per day. Other days, it's just not quite that easy. So finding patterns that we can, you know, incorporate into our daily lives, I think are really, really important. So when it comes to lifestyle, I have a quick little pop quiz. I, I hope the animation works right. But just for those folks who are listening, uh, any guess on how much of the brain is water? So 50, 60, 75, 85%. I, I wish I had the Jeopardy music right now. But um, <laughs> let's, let's, 85. Okay, good, good guess. 75%. So, I mean, our brain is just like swimming in a sea of water. So when we get dehydrated, one of the first symptoms people get is either brain fog or headaches. So my, my folks who are struggling with brain fog and headaches, hydration is key. I saw you take that sip of water, Elizabeth. Yeah. <laughs> And especially during the summer months, I mean, we're we're losing a lot more water than we're used to. Sometimes I'll even have folks add, you know, minerals into their water, um, just especially if you're out doing, you know, exerting yourselves in the sun, it can be really easy to get dehydrated rather quickly in the summertime. So hydration is absolutely crucial, you know. There's been studies showing that even people who are mildly dehydrated show changes in their mood. They show changes in their ability to focus and concentrate. So again, this is something that, you know, most of us can do on a daily basis is really making sure we're getting, you know, half of our body weight in ounces. So if you're maybe a 160 pound person, 80 ounces of water per day is kind of a good marker for you. But again, if you're out running a marathon in 80 degree weather, you're going to need you're going to need more water than that. So just kind of having a nice starting point uh, to consider. All right, sleep. Oh my gosh, I could probably spend a whole other topic just um, going on sleep. But what I found really interesting was a study showing that a single night of sleep deprivation can create more intense responses to negative or unpleasant situations. So you know, we've all heard of the joke where people get angry when they're hungry, so they're hangry, but that also ties into when we are sleep deprived. I don't know about you, but if I don't get a good night's sleep, I can be quite irritable. So I definitely <laughs> sympathize with this study, but think about people who have been struggling with sleep issues for months or maybe years. I mean, their whole outlook on life is significantly skewed um, because they're not getting that good quality sleep that they need. And we know that sleep is one of the most impact, important factors for our brain health. Our brain cells actually shrink while we're sleeping. So the fluid in our brain um, actually kind of, it kind of acts like a little bit of a washing machine. The brain cells shrink. There's more space between the brain cells. The fluid goes in there and kind of 
get, delivers nutrients, removes waste materials. So it's this really beautiful process, but that can only occur A, if we're hydrated, and B, if we are getting good quality and good quantity sleep. Now, this study found that after one night of staying awake, so pulling an all-nighter, participants experienced 30% higher anxiety levels. So again, it's not just going without sleep for, you know, long periods of time, but even short-term sleep deprivation can have significantly um, pronounced effects on brain health, mood, et cetera. Now, movement, I... I think I prefer the term movement because for some people, exercise kind of has a little bit of a negative connotation. So I, I say movement, but you know, if you want to use it interchangeably with exercise, by all means, movement, of course, is one of our most important um, foundations of health. You know, if we could somehow package all of the benefits that you get from movement or exercise into a medication, it would be the most successful medication on the market. You know, there is really no health condition that can't benefit from some type of movement. So strength training specifically, so using like weights or resistance, can slow or prevent long-term brain degeneration, um, particularly in the areas of the brain that are associated with memory and learning. So these are some of the key areas that tend to be impacted by things like dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And then um, resistance training has also increased in uh, function in the brain in regions like the frontal lobe, which helps us with our decision-making processes, our ability to um, judge and perceive, and what we consider more of like the executive functioning in our brain. Now, walking is probably one of my favorite exercises for folks. And if you can walk and, you know, maybe get close to a jogging speed, even better, um, just kind of a little bit more more steps per minute, but walking just 3,800 steps per day can reduce the risk of cognitive decline by 25%. You know, again, there's not really a drug or a medication out there that could even come close to that. Um, and this statistic I absolutely love too, it's walking 10,000 steps per day can reduce the risk of cancer and dementia better than any current conventional treatment. So we always talk about, you know, 10,000 steps per day. And for a lot of people, that really tends to be the sweet spot. Um, obviously, any movement is better than no movement. So if you are struggling, you know, don't try and get 10,000 steps per day, but kind of gradually work your way up there. Um, but again, better than any current treatment um, and not just dementia, but also reducing your risk of cancer. So again, really thinking here about long-term health and wellness. Okay, so just to kind of summarize what we just talked about, drinking half of our body weight in pounds, um, in ounces per day. So again, 150 pound person, 75 ounces of water, but adding lemon or electrolytes in the summertime helps us stay hydrated even more. And then sleeping for seven to nine hours per night. For some people, they're like, oh my gosh, I can get by with four or five, no big deal. But you know, we're really shortchanging ourselves in the sleep department. And, you know, some people may be able to tolerate that while, you know, maybe they're in their 20s or their 30s. But as we start to age, those those lost nights of sleep start to catch up with us. So I think really setting ourselves up for success in our future selves is what we need to be doing today. So, um, and ideally when you do get seven to nine hours of sleep, you're waking refreshed. Um, if you're not getting that amount or you're not waking refreshed, you know, could, could try some sleep support, which I'm sure the folks at Marlene's have some great ideas. I also put into um, practice or I try, I'm not always the best at this either, but it's this three, two, one kind of guideline. So ideally not having um, food, at least like a big heavy meal about three hours before bed, because when we eat, it takes a lot of energy to digest food. But when we're sleeping, we should really be using a lot of that energy towards our repair processes in the body. So if we eat a big heavy meal and then we go to bed shortly after that, we're kind of um, diverting our resources away from the healing and growth processes um, towards digestion. Also limiting fluids about two hours before bed, especially for folks who are struggling with getting up, you know, one or more times throughout the night to go to the bathroom. And then 
This is probably the toughest one, but no screen time for an hour before bed. Uh, it really does make a difference, um, especially with helping our bodies produce our own natural sources of melatonin. Um, and when we're looking at blue screens, that melatonin production gets very minimal, if any. So really doing our best to kind of maybe do something like reading a book or journaling or meditating or something that doesn't uh, involve screen times, ideally. And then, of course, our goal when it comes to movement is 150 minutes of moderate intensity movement per week. And then adding in two days of strength training is just like icing on the cake. All right. So Last but certainly not least, as far as tools go, is going to be targeted supplements. So when I'm working with patients and, you know, they present with whatever health condition they have, um, in addition to the nutrition recommendations and lifestyle, I do tend to use um, supplements as well, because I think supplements can be a game changer for a lot of people, you know, traditionally we would be using a lot of plant medicines, whether we're eating them or making teas, but we don't quite have that same relationship. So I think supplements can really help bridge that gap for a lot of people. And when we are thinking, oops, I don't know, my, now my computer is thinking, oops, don't know what happened there. Excuse me for just a moment. <laughs> uh, okay. So I'm back up here. So when I'm thinking about supplements for brain health specifically, I typically have um, kind of two primary goals. Number one is we want to neutralize that chronic unresolved inflammation, because as we saw, that leads to a lot of symptoms and, you know, can be kind of one of what we consider the root causes of brain dysfunction. So when we're looking at inflammation markers in people, one of the key markers we use is something called C-reactive protein or CRP. So one study showed that the CRP level was 70% higher in adolescent girls who were suffering from depression versus those who were not depressed. So we know that inflammation and some of its markers play a big role in a broad spectrum of, um, you know, brain dysfunction or disorders, mental health conditions. Uh, inflammation has also been linked to things like anxiety, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. So the second goal is increasing a compound in the brain called brain-derived neurotropic factor, much easier to say BDNF. Basically, when I was still doing my undergrad um, for my biology degree, we still learned that you were born with as many neurons as you were going to get. So, you know, um, wear your helmets, don't drink too much at your bachelor, bachelorette parties, you know, do whatever you can to try and preserve those brain cells because that's it. Um, but over the past, you know, decade or two, we really learned that we do produce small amounts of new neurons every single day. But when we are dealing with things like inflammation or chronic stress or a lot of other factors, that process of creating new neurons comes kind of to a stop. Uh, we're not creating those new neurons, which really helps us create a lot of new connections in our brain. Um, so basically, increasing BDNF encourages the growth of new neurons, uh, helping us better transmit messages to and from the brain to all of the far-reaching places in our body, but it also helps to pr uh, protect our existing neurons from damage. This is also really key. We don't all, only want to produce new neurons, but we want to protect the ones we have, and this is um, absolutely crucial for learning and memory. So one of my favorite options for um, both of those goals is curcumin. Uh, you've probably heard of curcumin. It comes from turmeric, but it is a really powerful anti-inflammatory. So it touches just about every inflammatory pathway in the body, um, bringing things back into balance. Curcumin also increases BDNF. So again, that BDNF, uh, we typically see lower levels in folks with Alzheimer's disease, sometimes as low as 20 to 40% than um, healthy controls. And we also see lower BDNF levels in conditions like depression and a variety of other mental health disorders. So it makes sense if we're not able to produce new neurons, our brain is not going to be functioning as optimally as it should. So we're going to take a quick sidetrack here and just talk about major depressive disorder or often abbreviated MDD, but tends to impact about 17 million adults. 
And interestingly, women are twice as likely to have major depressive disorders. So there's some theories out there that maybe there's some hormonal components um, or other factors that may be involved. And the average age of onset for folks with major depressive disorder is about 32 and a half. I will say that that's probably going to start shifting to a younger age, uh, especially folks coming out of the pandemic and dealing with more depression and anxiety issues at a younger age. Um, But yeah, not only is it folks in their 30s, but we're also seeing older adults. So over the age of 65, about 7 million of them are, are also affected by depression. You know, um, if you've ever had a loved one, maybe a parent or grandparent dealing with some type of dementia or Alzheimer's disease, one of the big signs that we see are changes in personality or changes in mood. And again, it's because we're having inflammation, oxidative stress, all of these processes occurring in the brain, preventing the brain from functioning optimally, not just for learning and memory, but also when it comes to mood. Now, there was this really interesting quote found in JAMA, which is a a big publication that puts out a lot of research papers, but basically stating that the prevalence of depressive symptoms in the U.S. was more than threefold higher during the COVID-19 epidemic compared um, from the before times. You know, and I think we're still dealing with a lot of the fallout from that because unfortunately we had a big shortage of mental health care providers during the pandemic because everyone was looking for some support. So there definitely are a lot of things that we can do to support the brain and also support our mood in general. So what I love about curcumin is it helps to address depression from multiple angles. You know, there are antidepressant medications out there, and sometimes they can be life-changing for a lot of people, but a lot of times the medications typically have one target or one objective, and that's that's what they do. But what I love about botanicals and herbs and a lot of these natural options is they're, they somehow have this like wisdom to uh, adjust multiple pathways in the body, in the body to bring things back into balance. So curcumin, you know, neutralizes oxidative stress, neutralizes inflammation, helps us with our stress response, which we call the HPA axis. And then of course, also influences the activity of forming new neurons. So by kind of orchestrating all of these events in the body, that's where we can see a lot of really positive shifts um, in the brain and um, neurological system in general. Now, there was an interesting study looking at a specific type of curcumin called BCM95. This is curcumin combined with turmeric essential oil, but it was studied in comparison to a prescription medication called fluoxetine. Fluoxetine is a one of the first line medications for depression. It's an SSRI, so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Sometimes it goes by the name of Prozac. But basically, the participants in the study had major depressive disorder, and they were given either fluoxetine, curcumin, or a combination for six weeks. Now, as we can see, the fluoxetine group, they were given 20 milligrams per day, and they had about a 65% response rate. The curcumin, they were given 500 milligrams twice per day, um, slightly lower, maybe about a 62 or a 63% response rate. But interestingly enough, the combination of fluoxetine and curcumin had almost an 80% response rate. So I find this study fascinating for a couple of reasons. Number one, curcumin performed very similarly to, you know, one of the first line medications that we use for depression. But number two, it had an even more pronounced impact when it was combined with the medication. So of course, I always have to give the caveat that anyone who is on a prescription medication needs to consult with their healthcare practitioner um, when they are at wanting to add in a supplement. But I do think that this study gives a lot of um, you know really great insight for how herbs and botanicals can be safely combined and even have a synergistic effect with some of the medications out there. So protecting the brain with curcumin was also shown to protect brain cells from toxins. This was um, an animal model where they exposed the cells to fluoride and it protected the brain cells by um, 75%. We know that high levels of fluoride can be toxic to the brain. So this was a really interesting study and again, stimulates the formation of new 
brain cells um, almost doubled the amount of new brain cells. And then last but certainly not least, there's been research showing that curcumin helps to reduce the size of what we call the beta amyloid plaques. These are kind of like the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. When we have things like um, inflammation in the brain, it creates structural changes to our proteins. Those proteins and things get more sticky and then they kind of clump together and they form these like plaques. And this really interferes with our brain's ability, you know, to send messages to and from. Um, so basically shown to reduce the average size of those plaques by about 30%. Again, not really medications out there that have this same type. It was an animal model, um, but again, I think it gives us some really interesting insight into the power of some of these natural substances. So curcumin, of course, there's a lot of different um, options out there. I just want to highlight a couple that I find really important when choosing a curcumin is you want something that's, of course, going to be absorbed. Uh, also, that crosses the blood-brain barrier since we are looking at using curcumin specifically for brain health, at least in this application. There is this kind of like... Um, the, these cells that their job is to let things in and out of our brain. And of course we can, we only want those cells to let in helpful things and we want them to get rid of metabolic waste. So in this case, we wanna be able to let that curcumin into the brain so it can exert some of its benefit. Also want a curcumin that's been shown in clinical research, meaning uh, research that's been done in humans. And I prefer curcumin with turmeric essential oil just because it doesn't have any harmful extraction methods um, and it's a natural way to kind of boost the absorption. Now we're gonna switch gears and talk about another one of my favorite plants, which is ginseng. So ginseng is what we call an adaptogen. Adaptogens are plants, it's kind of like a, an elite group of, group of plants that help us adapt to a variety of stressors. When we are under stress, we all know our brain is not performing at its best. You know, we're usually maybe a little flustered for words, or maybe we're a little more irritable, or, you know, sometimes people get really tired when they're under stress. So what I find really nice about ginseng is because it's an adaptogen, again, it has multiple ways to bring the body back into balance. Adaptogens don't really push in one way or another, but they're always pushing back to balance. So they help to enhance physical and mental performance. They help to promote vitality and longevity. They protect against the negative uh, effects of stress and aging. So some of the big categories um, that we see ginseng used for include things like focus and concentration, energy, inflammation, allergies, et cetera, et cetera. One of my favorite uses, though, is for improving attention and focus and concentration. So this study was really interesting because it was looking at healthy individuals with high levels of occupational stress. I'm sure no one out there can relate to high levels of work-related stress, but basically the um, participants took this specific form of red ginseng or white ginseng or placebo. So they took all of them but with a two week period in between. So maybe they took the ginseng first, then waited two weeks, then they took the white ginseng, waited two weeks, and then they took placebo. That's what we call a washout period. So the researchers were looking at the change in attention rates. So basically these folks were given, you know, the ginseng and then Right away in the morning, our work performance maybe tends to be a little bit better. You know, we're we're kind of still bright eyed and bushy tailed and, you know, we haven't had all these extra stressors. But then over the course of the day, it's logical to assume that we're going to perhaps make more errors. So our attention rates kind of decrease. So what we saw was the folks who took this HRG80 red ginseng had improvements in their attention because their error rate decreased. Now, they found results, um, positive results, just on the first day of use that improved throughout the entire 12 day period of taking the ginseng. But for the folks taking the white ginseng or placebo, their error rates increased, meaning their attention scores decreased overall. So the red ginseng really um, outperformed. And again, results in, in as little as the first day, which can be a big difference for folks who are under a lot of stress. And especially when that stress is um, impacting our, our ability to make decisions. So 
We know that ginseng kind of fell out of favor. It was used for a really long time, but um, it kind of became a victim of its own popularity. It was harvested almost to extinction in the wild. So now a lot of ginseng farmers are growing it conventionally, um, but because it's a root crop that needs to stay in the ground for seven to 10 years, a lot of times they're using a lot of really um, harmful substances. So pesticides, herbicides, fungicides to protect that crop. So um, the ginseng that I tend to recommend is actually hydroponically grown and it's concentrated to have higher levels of key compounds that you want in your ginseng um, without any of the pesticides or herbicides that you don't want in your ginseng. So this is um, a really great option for, you know, stamina, endurance, brain power. I think about this, especially, um, you know, for kids when they're going through like final exams or college students or athletes. So a lot of applications um, outside of just supporting, you know, attention, focus, and concentration as well. Now, Greek mountain tea is probably a new one to most people. It's available for the first time in a capsule form in the United States. As the name implies, it was traditionally consumed as a tea. Uh, I will say the biggest question I get asked about this one is, is it the same as green tea, which it is not, it does not contain caffeine. Um, but what's really nice about this is it grows in places like Mediterranean and Bulgaria. And shepherds who were tending to like their flocks of animals, like sheep or whatever, they would cons they would pick this herb. It's called sideritis, is uh, the Latin name, and they would pick this herb, brew it into a tea, and they found that it really helped them um, increase their attention and focus because they got to be alert for their herd. You know, they got to make sure there's not predators out there. They got to kind of keep an eye on the weather patterns and et cetera. So it's been clinically studied to relieve anxiety and also increase focus and concentration. So it's been historically used in the Mediterranean for a long period of time. And now, uh, you know, science is starting to catch up with some of those traditional usages. But what I love about this um, Greek mountain tea is it really helps to kind of calm down after hard work, you know, because sometimes we get done with a day of work and you're just like so amped up. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm never going to be able to settle down. So this can be really helpful for that. Yeah. And then you crash. Exactly. Also helps to minimize stress and anxiety, promotes healing. It's been shown to preserve memory, increase stamina and resilience. So I think some really key factors here to um, brain health and also just longevity as a whole. So some of the research that's been done on Greek mountain tea showed that it, again, helped to reduce beta amyloid buildup in the brain by about 55%. Uh, in a human study, it was shown to improve reaction time under stress by 50% in healthy individuals. Sometimes when we get stressed, we kind of go into like fight, flight, or freeze. Some people just like get so stressed out that their body just kind of like shuts down and they can't make a decision, you know, to, to save their life. So improving reaction time under stress when combined with B vitamins also help to balance cortisol levels, uh, been shown to improve attention and reduce stress and anxiety in folks aged 50 to 70 years old in just one month of use. And of course, minimizing stress is absolutely essential because stress is a killer. It shortens our lifespan. Uh, there was a 2020 study showing that chronically high stress levels shortened our lifespans by almost three years. So finding things that can help us, you know, preserve our brain health, minimize our stress and kind of extend our lifespan in general, I think can be can be really, really important. Now we have just a couple more to get through and then I just want to make sure we have time for uh, any questions, but ashwagandha is another adaptogen. So again, always helping to restore the body back to balance. It's been um, used in Ayurveda, which is a traditional medicine system of India for over 3000 years. Historically, it's been used for energy, stamina, endurance, mental function, um, alleviating anxiety and depression, helping with cortisol and blood sugar levels. So really kind of covers all of our bases when we're thinking about optimizing our brain performance. There was a study looking at um, a specific type of uh, ashwagandha for stress relief. So 60 stressed but otherwise healthy adults took EP35 ashwagandha, um, standardized to a high percentage of withanolides, which are some of the key compounds in ashwagandha. 
And after just 60 days of taking it, they had a 30 to 40% reduction in depression and anxiety scores um, versus only 10 to 24% reduction for the placebo group. They had a 23% reduction in cortisol levels, um, no change for placebo, and then an 11% increase in testosterone in men, but no change for women. So we know that stress also impacts our ability to balance our hormones properly and no change in hormone levels for men or women in the placebo group. So again, just two months of taking ashwagandha and we saw some big shifts in stress, anxiety, and hormone balance. Um, again, that really set us up for success for brain health overall. Now, one of the key factors we also talked about was sleep and it's important for its importance for brain health. So ashwagandha has also been useful for supporting healthy sleep. So 150, again, otherwise healthy individuals having non-restorative sleep took this ashwagandha or placebo, and they took it in the evening, um, kind of like before their last meal of the night. And after six weeks, there was a significant improvement in total sleep time. Um, also sleep efficiency, meaning the time in which you lay down to the time that you were actually able to fall asleep and increases in overall quality of life. So what I love about ashwagandha is it can be energizing for you if you need energy during the day, but it also helps you calm down in the evening and when you need to get restful sleep. So it's kind of that, again, beauty of using adaptogens is they, they kind of always know what the body needs to get back to balance. Okay, so omega-3s, we talked about these a little bit in the nutrition section, but basically these are essential fatty acids that are usually derived from fish. They're called essential because we cannot make them, um, but having higher levels of omega-3 helps to preserve brain structure in middle age. So looking here at about um, in 40s and 50 year olds and also preserves the um, brain volume in a region of the brain called the hippocampus, which is really one of our primary learning and memory centers. Also higher levels of blood omega-3s have been shown to improve lifespan, um, five years more of lifespan compared to folks with lower levels of omega-3s. And since omega-3s make up the, the membranes or help to make up our cell membranes, they also impact how we are able to send signals throughout our body, uh, including using things like our neurotransmitters, whether that's, you know, dopamine, acetylcholine, et cetera. So many, many body-wide benefits for omega-3s. And of course, there are a sea of options when we have omega-3 supplements. So I typically look for an omega-3 complex from salmon that's not an oil base. Um, so no concerns with toxins, heavy metals, or contaminants. Uh, uses omega-3s like DHA and EPA in their um, bioidentical form, meaning as you would find them in, in us humans, and the chemical-free extraction process and bound to phospholipids. So that's the omega-3 that I tend to recommend for, for folks. Last but certainly not least is helping to relieve anxiety. And in this case, we're talking about echinacea, which for some of you plant people out there, you're like, hmm, I know echinacea helps for things like colds and flu, but I haven't heard of it for anxiety specifically. But basically there is a specific type um, of echinacea called echinacea angustifolia that helps to trigger calmness without affecting consciousness. So it works through the endocannabinoid system. You probably have heard about endocannabinoid system because cannabis tends to get the most um, attention there, but the endocannabinoid system was also only discovered within about the past 30 to 40 years. It's kind of one of our master regulatory systems in the body. Um, but these compounds extracted from the echinacea roots are called alchemides, and they're similar in structure to endocannabinoids, meaning the cat cannabinoids that we naturally produce in our brain and our body. So they have similar effects, but again, not going to negatively impact your thinking or focus or attention. So you alleviate anxiety without having, you know, maybe some of those consciousness effects like you might with, um, you know, something like THC where folks, you know, are, are feeling a little bit more kind of spacey or maybe they're craving a brownie or something like that. But basically this 
this really helps to influence that endocannabinoid system without any of the, the downsides that we might have. So these echinacea plants themselves are grown in rural areas. So away from things like industry and pollution, they're harvested and washed by hand and dried naturally. The whole process is really quite wonderful. Um, but yeah, that's one of my go-tos for folks, whether they're struggling with acute anxiety, let's say you have to get on an airplane and you're petrified of flying, or you know maybe more of a long-term anxiety issue. So think something like a generalized anxiety disorder. So what I love about this um, echinacea is it's also been studied in humans, uh, three human clinical trials showing that there were pronounced effects on anxiety in just the first day. Of course, the results improved with continued use, no significant adverse effects, also um, safe for kiddos over the age of four. So again, we're seeing more anxiety in, in younger kids. So this is a nice option kind of for the whole family and also no known interactions with prescription anti-anxiety medications. But again, always talk to your prescriber if you are going to you know consider adding something in and you are on some type of anti-anxiety medication. All right, so here is a quick summary. We've got curcumin and omega-3s for depression, um, red ginseng and Greek mountain tea for focus and concentration. We have curcumin. I also tend to combine it with um, a couple of botanicals, Spanish sage and rosemary, and then also vitamin D for things like dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, folks who have low levels of vitamin D by age 65 are more than twice as likely to have cognitive decline um, versus those who have um, more favorable vitamin D levels. Uh, also ashwagandha, great for stress relief, mood support, focus, and then um, echinacea and gustifolia for anxiety. So again, brain health, just to kind of wrap it up here, it's arguably one of the most important systems in the body. It impacts our mood, our thinking, our judgment, dictates our bodily functions. So sleep and glandular activities, every single thing that goes on in our body has to be, you know, complexly orchestrated within our brain and our neurological system. So protecting our brain health should absolutely be a number one priority. And hopefully you have a couple new tools that you can um, kind of add to your toolkit when thinking about brain health and longevity. So there is a couple of my my dogs <laughs> there at the bottom left. They, they were much, much younger than they're now like 60 plus pounds, but the Chihuahua still runs the show. Uh, <laughs> so um, if you have any you know questions, you can email me. Otherwise I do have um, a website that has like some nice resources on there for patients or you know people who are just looking to learn a little bit more about my approach to medicine. So that is all I have for today and I'll stick around and see if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Locke. Fabulous presentation. I learned so much. Yay. I had to get I had to get hydrated. <laughs> exactly. It's like once you start talking about it, it's like, oh wow, I, I had no idea. I was so thirsty. And then it's also with, you know, you were sharing so much amazing in, information. You know, the the mouth tends to get a little parched. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, I do find too, this time of year, anytime anyone is about to lick their lips, I'm always like, oh, that is a, that is a big sign right there that you need some, some water. So just kind of keeping that in the back of our minds too, as we transition to these more, um, you know, summer, summer type months. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I, um, when the when that heat wave came through um the first time i noticed i started doing that and i was like oh i need to amp up my water and electrolytes game <laughs> i am curious about the electrolyte powder i haven't heard of that one specifically but i am all about trying all of the different electrolytes so i'm going to go and read that article that you posted in the chat oh definitely yes um thank you yeah um uh I was able to learn quite a lot from um that that article and um, oh, just looked, looked further at their website and yeah superior um electrolyte is definitely a superior electrolyte yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well I think about it too like I'm a crazy plant person and it's like when you give plants just water, you're kind of just like slowly killing them over time. Cause it's like, we need water, but we also need a lot of other things 
that come along with that, you know? So if we're only drinking water over time, we're actually going to get a bit dehydrated because the water is not able to get to where it needs to go. So we need some of those, you know, minerals or whatever it is, um, and electrolytes to make sure that the water that we're using is kind of supercharging us and keeping us nice and hydrated. Thank you. Oh, yes. Kevin, you're more than welcome to ask a question. Hi, this is actually his wife, Farina. Hi. Hi. I have a, I have a question for Dr. Law. The echinacea, is there, what type do you use? Because if you use the echinacea for colds and flus, it tells you to stop for a while. So That's what's the difference? That's a really great question. So most people are familiar with echinacea for immune support, but this is echinacea angustifolia, and it's actually compounds extracted and concentrated from the root. So it's not a full spectrum, um, you know, echinacea, it's compounds that are specifically pulled out because they've been researched and found to have beneficial effects on the endocannabinoid system and relieving anxiety. So typically when people are taking echinacea for like cold and flu, they're maybe taking, you know, 600 or 900 or more milligrams per day because it tends to have more of an immune stimulating property. So you only want to do that for shorter periods of time and then kind of, um, Sometimes people will call like pulse dosing where you take it for two, three weeks and then you stop. But in this case, this is not that same type of echinacea and it's more, it's an extraction of the compounds that we want from echinacea. Um, and so it's only 20 to 40 milligrams. So much, much lower dosage and totally safe to take long-term. I know people who have been on it for, for several years um, because it's not, it doesn't have that same like immune stimulating effect that uh, certain echinaceas can. So uh, how do I know the difference at the store? <laughs> what well, what I do I look for? <laughs> I think if you go into Marlene's, they would be able to, if you said I'm looking for echinacea for anxiety, I think that they would have a really good idea of kind of where to direct you um, just because this is a, a different, you know, type of echinacea and it's, um, yeah, you can find it in a supplemental form. Like I said, I'm just, just here to do education today, but the folks at Marlene can absolutely pair you with the right type um, of echinacea for anxiety relief. So the name that you have written here is the official name of the anxiety one, correct? Yep, if you, if you look up echinacea and gustafolia and anxiety, it'll also probably cue you in the right direction. <laughs> yeah, and um, kind of like a little mnemonic devices, um, the echinacea that helps with anxiety, um, maybe like the month of August gives you anxiety because that nice. Augustus kind of looks like August. Yes, yes. I love <laughs> always need those those remember rem, remembering tips <laughs> oh yes <laughs> yeah especially thank with you for facts. thank you so much of course oh thank you Verena. great question and um uh folks i put um uh dr lexi locks uh personal website there in the chat also to help out and then um, you can reach her here at the email. But um, I was curious, um, what are your thoughts about glutathione for brain health? I'm a big fan of glutathione. Um, I didn't have it in today's presentation, but there is a sublingual form of glutathione that I really like. Glutathione is one of the body's primary antioxidants. Um, if we don't have enough glutathione on board, it, you know, unfortunately will probably lead a much shorter lifespan when they have, when people have genetic differences in their ability to produce glutathione. Unfortunately, they tend to have a lot more you know, chronic diseases or just a shorter life in general. So I think glutathione, you know, it's, there's some research on it in more of a, like an intravenous setting for things like Parkinson's disease. But I think about supplemental glutathione is a lot more accessible for people. And I think, you know, again, 
if we can up our antioxidants, this is going to decrease the free radicals and oxidative stress and inflammation. Um, so I think it's, you know, another really big tool in our toolkit that we can use for, you know, brain health, neurological health, and really just whole body health, because we're, we're constantly producing free radicals in our mitochondria, which are the little powerhouses of our cells. And we're constantly exposed to things that can cause free radicals in our environment. So it's like the more antioxidants we can provide ourselves with, you know, I think um, we're kind of just having to do our due diligence at this point um, with what we're dealing with internally and externally. Definitely. Like, you know, like the air quality and, you know, our, our soil has depleted, you know, over, you know, uh, the last several decades. And so, yeah, we're having to do more to counteract what is going on. And I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah. A hundred percent, hundred percent. Yes. <laughs> it's a, it's a big topic and I love, love, love glutathione. So yes, good recommendation. <laughs> yeah. I've been looking more into it and it's uh, fascinating what, you know, what it does. And, um, you just, you just sold me. So <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> Well, let me check Facebook here, see if we have any live questions, but um, folks in the Zoom meeting, feel free while we have our wonderful presenter here, if there's any questions. All right, there's no questions there. We're gonna go ahead and say goodbye to our Facebook Live friends and open up the meeting here in Zoom. So thanks for tuning in.